History as it happens, January 28th, 2021, The Radical King. The civil rights icon's 1963 speech is part of our nation's soundtrack, but there was much more to Martin Luther King's work than his mesmerizing call for racial reconciliation. At a time of racial strife, economic duress, and endless wars, let's retrieve the more radical, forgotten parts of King's legacy as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. For the sake of those boys, for the sake of this government for the sake of the hundreds of thousands trembling under our violence i cannot be silent hello everybody welcome to episode four you know when the mlk holiday came and went this year it didn't seem like there was enough time for us to reflect on it not with washington consumed by uh, the political dramas of the day but there's been something else on my mind for years now when it comes to remembering dr martin luther king jr And that is, we really don't, at least in mainstream discourse, the more complicated parts of his life and legacy have been kind of sanitized. King criticized capitalism. He called out white moderates. He condemned the Vietnam War because of the death it rained down on the Vietnamese and for the damage it did to the war on poverty at home. Listen to this, King on the Merv Griffin Show, 1967. I think this war is playing havoc with our domestic destinies. It has been estimated that we spend about $500,000 to kill every enemy soldier, uh, while we spend only about $53 a year for every person categorized as poverty-stricken. Now, this seems to me, and I'm sure to anybody else looking at it realistically, Uh, to be a tragic uh, order in terms of priorities. King tied all these issues together. U.S. militarism, the defects, as he saw them, of capitalism and both overt and subtle forms of racism, they all combined, in his view, to hold back the cause of freedom. And this is important because, well, let's take a look around us. Endless wars in faraway places. We just went through a summer of racial protest over police brutality. Donald Trump rode a wave of populist fervor to the White House, fueled in part by racial resentments. On January 6th, the mob the number of known white supremacists attacked Congress. And now there's a new presidential administration whose policies are explicitly designed to attack racism. King is as relevant as ever. Raymond Arsenault is the John Hope Franklin Professor of Southern History at the University of South Florida. He is the author of Freedom Riders, 1961 and the Struggle for Racial Justice, among 10 books on the civil rights movement. And he joins us for a conversation now, starting with whether he agrees with the premise of this episode. Has King's legacy been sanitized? Uh, Yes, I do think that Dr. King's legacy has been sanitized in many, many cases, and simplified for sure. The full profile of his activism, of his kind of revolutionary nonviolence is often lost, I think, to the general public and even to some scholars. It really sells him short as a very impactful figure in American history and and world history, that his, his radicalism, I think, is sometimes forgotten because he was such a devoted follower of nonviolence. Why do you think that is? Well, it was true to some degree during King's lifetime. It's not just a a recent phenomenon. You know, there was confusion about who he was during his civil rights career. In the last three years of his life, he was much more forceful in his rhetoric, in his critique of the Vietnam War, of poverty, of capitalism. He, He really was, to a large degree, a democratic socialist. He didn't use that term. Michael Harrington, of course, kind of coined that term. But, you know, once the national holiday was started in 1986, inevitably they would try to kind of smooth things out or smooth things over to make him palatable to the, a broad swath of the American public. I think they detach it from the context where he was really looking for a thoroughgoing 
kind of overturning of the kind of mainstream of American culture that he thought the nation had certainly had gone wrong in the 1960s. And would you say this explains part of our problem today? You know, our society has so much trouble even discussing race without rankling people, making them feel defensive. So it kind of makes sense that we celebrate a sanitized king. Yeah, I think Dr. King realized, and, and, and his, his apostles and many people who followed him, you know, there's the old adage, you know, to make an omelet, you have to break a few eggs, that even though he was a, absolutely committed to nonviolence, he was not passive in any way. You know, he, he was willing to disrupt the, the civic order. In fact, he thought it was essential that silence is not necessarily peace, as he once put it, that he wanted to bring about a, a just peace and to really alter the kind of institutional structure of well, not only American society, I and mean, the last essay that he wrote before he died was called The World House, where he talked about the internationalization of civil rights and of justice into a more human rights configuration. The idea that it, even if the civil rights movement were to be successful in the United States, that would not be the end of the story, not by the end of the goal of his movement, because he wanted to make sure that we, we didn't create a, a haven of peace in the United States at the expense of other people around the world. We couldn't base our democracy on the oppression or exploitation or even, you know, kind of a passive attitude towards the rest of the world. And his most well-known oratory, the I Have a Dream speech, we've all heard it so many times, we can play it in our mind's audio system. I have a dream. My poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream to be. August 28, 1963, in Washington, the year before the Civil Rights Act was enacted, two years before the Voting Rights Act. But his Beyond Vietnam speech, delivered in measured tones for an hour at a packed church in New York City in 1967, a year before his death, was, in my view, just as powerful. Uh, King admits, right, that he had been silent about Vietnam for too long. Why was that important? Well, among scholars who study King's life and, and legacy, the Riverside Church speech of March 1967 is absolutely crucial to, I think many of us feel, to understanding King as a leader, as a human being. He'd first spoken out against the Vietnam War in March of 1965 really at the request of some other civil rights leaders, he had he had not made it kind of the center of his argument about how American society should be reformed or revolutionized even. I mean, it was known that he was against the war, but he muted it a bit. But finally, he decided he just couldn't do it any longer. And so at this speech in March of 1967, in front of 4,000 people, King decided to let it all, all out, really. His advisors warned him against it. They, they really thought it was going to alienate people both within the civil rights movement and in the broader society and that, that, that he was really going to lose face and lose stature. Because it would make him sound less patriotic? Well, I think less patriotic is part of it, but it was the notion that the alliance, if you can call it that, with, with President Lyndon Johnson had been so successful in bringing about the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 but of course, Johnson had his own political agenda. He, what, he, what he gave with the right hand, he sometimes took back to some degree with his left hand. And people within the movement knew that, that. But the public persona of Lyndon Johnson is that he was four square behind the civil rights movement. And he, there had been a lot of dissension between King and President Johnson really going back to 1965. Of course, the FBI and Jager Hoover had been investigating King and trying to discredit him. And Johnson knew that and, and did not stop them, really, did not uh, prevent Hoover from using this COINTELPRO program to delegitimize leaders like Dr. King. But I think the American population was turning towards an anti-war position at that very moment. I mean, really, 67 is the key year. But there were a lot of people who had not quite reached that point, particularly people who were so passionate about the civil rights movement. They wanted a single focus. They thought this would, would be a drag on the movement. And, and of course, King had already uh, said enough to alienate quite a few people. In other words, he was not really considered to be the same figure he was when he won the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize in 1964. Uh, and he knew that, again, not just in the general population, but within the movement. There was a tremendous amount of opposition to him making this anti-Vietnam War speech in the Riverside Church in March of 1967. 
And the reaction was overwhelmingly negative. He took a tremendous amount of criticism from civil rights figures like Carl Rowan and Roy Wilkins, and, and even people close to him were really quite upset. I mean, they, they had no choice but to go along with him in, in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, but it, it was really a tremendous amount of turmoil over his statements, in part because he was such a truth teller. Well, let's listen to a short excerpt of Martin Luther King's Beyond Vietnam. They ask if our own nation wasn't using massive doses of violence to solve its problem bring about the changes it wanted. Their questions hit home, and I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. Greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. That is not some milk toast oratory. That's right, and he... He made a point after the speech, when he was receiving so much criticism, to say, these people really have not known me. If they're surprised at me taking these positions, uh, they really have not known who I really was. And I think if you look at his life closely, you see that he had been not a, a complete pacifist, but had very strong pacifist feelings. You know, going back to the early 1950s at the Crozer Seminary and then later at Boston University getting his PhD. And of course, he studied Gandhi, not as much as he would later. Of course, he's later termed as the American Gandhi. But I think his notion of that militarism was a huge problem in the world. He had felt that way for a long time. He hadn't fully articulated. He wasn't in a position to do so. He was too busy fighting to desegregate the buses in Montgomery during the bus boycott or supporting the sit-ins or the freedom rides. But people who knew him well knew that this was not a sharp break ideologically or philosophically for him. He had felt this way for a very long time. And King linked the war in Vietnam to the failure of the great society at home, correct? Uh, America could not have guns and butter. It seemed as if there was a real promise of hope for the poor, both black and white, through the poverty program. There were experiments, hopes, new beginnings. Then came the build-up in Vietnam, and I watched this program broken and eviscerated as if it was some idle political plaything of a society gone mad on war. And I knew that America would never invest the necessary funds or energies in rehabilitation of its poor so long as adventures like Vietnam continued to draw men and skills and money like some demonic destructive suction tube. These complexities are often overlooked today, although they remain relevant. The United States still spends $700 billion annually on defense. Troops remain in Iraq and Afghanistan, and income inequality is at historic or near historic levels. Well, I think many people who define themselves as progressives certainly link those two things, that the war on poverty historically has failed, part because the appropriations have gone elsewhere. Right? And that the military industrial complex has promoted these kinds of appropriations, which spend far more money on blowing things up than trying to get people out of, out of poverty. So the, the great society that Lyndon Johnson proclaimed in the mid-1960s, I mean, did have some, some positive effects, but it was in Dr. King's view, and I think the view of many historians today, and certainly people who are of a progressive mindset, that it was eviscerated by his commitment to the, to the Vietnam War. And I think this, in, in, in King's sense, goes to his very deep, deep sense that the war against poverty was a, almost a kind of holy war for him, and he really believed in the social gospel. So the war in itself was, the militarism was horrific, but it's also what it prevented the society from doing in terms of addressing deep social problems. And for for him, I think that was equally important. And I think people see that same thing today, that if we could redirect even a fraction of the military budget towards issues involving social justice and equity and trying to combat the uh, maldistribution of wealth in our society, which is even worse today than it was then, we'd be going a long way towards making the world a better place, or certainly the United States a better place.
In 1966, a Gallup poll found two-thirds of Americans had an unfavorable opinion of Martin Luther King. Only a third had a positive opinion. Would he be surprised at how popular he is today? I think he would be surprised at how popular he is today, but I think he would probably would suspect the, the reasons for it, that, that he, again, he was sanitized, modulated, the mythic king, although a very admirable figure, does not really encompass the complexity, the, the depth of his critique of capitalist society, of militarism, of racism. People are willing to react to kind of moralistic platitudes, but not to the complexities of how you make fundamental changes in the nature of society and and the economy. And so he that wouldn't have surprised him at all. I mean, he was a student of history. He he knew that this is how it had happened to other people. This is this is not a uncommon phenomenon. I'm sure he'd be pleased to some degree that he wasn't totally forgotten and that his, some of his uh, disciples, like John Lewis, carried on his fight, even though the civil rights movement was fragmented after his death. Uh, many people continued to fight and have had some victories, maybe not as permanent victories as we had hoped, uh, that we're still, you know, freedom is, a, is always a struggle. I think he would be very sad, though, about the sanitization, about the fact that they didn't really get what he was trying to say. And one of King's criticisms that rankled people then and would probably rankle people today, his frustration with white moderates or just ordinary white citizens. Well, he said on a number of occasions that he was more concerned about them than he was about the Ku Klux Klan or the lunatic fringe or, you know, avowed segregationists, militant white supremacists, that it was the the silence coming from people who consider themselves to be people of goodwill and and, and to be moral and didn't think of themselves as racist. But in fact, they were a, a huge part of the problem that they were willing to look the other way. And any time, you know, they thought that maybe white privilege was threatened, and maybe some of this, I think he realized, was not always conscious. It could be subconscious as well, but that people were not willing to stand up, not willing to speak out. And I think that's what really gnawed at him throughout his life. He said it over and over again, that I know how to deal with the Bull Connors of the world, but the people who are, you know, singing in the church choir on Sunday morning, but do nothing really to uh, advance the cause of, of, of social justice, were were a huge problem to him. Your comments have me thinking of people who reacted with real anger at Colin Kaepernick for taking a knee during the national anthem, people who don't consider themselves racists, but maybe aren't willing to see things the way Kaepernick saw them. Well, absolutely. That's a very good, very good point. I mean, I think the problem is that uh, many, many people are not willing to do the, the heavy lifting that it takes to, to separate mythology from history. In, in American popular culture, there are so many sources of kind of mythic conceptions of the past and of the present. History and all of its complexity gets lost in the shuffle. People learn more history from the exhibits at Disney World than they do from you know, scholarly professional historians who devote their lives to trying to understand the complexities of the past, of trying to give us what we sometimes call a usable past. And it, it, ta- it takes effort. It takes time. And, you know, people, are, I think, are too diverted by popular culture, by materialism, by narcissism. There's so little, I think, civic education. So I think education, maybe a trite to say it, is the key to it all. Historian Raymond Arsenault has been with us on the podcast today. Raymond, I started this episode talking about why King's legacy, especially the overlooked parts we've been discussing, still relevant. Uh, The events of the past summer in hundreds of cities across the country, the Black Lives Matter protests, a reminder that his spirit lives on, but his work is incomplete. It is incomplete, but I I think it was so encouraging that so many people turned out who had never been involved in political activism before. I, I know many people that I, I was shocked at how committed they became. Five years ago, almost six years ago now, I guess, I, I was at the 50th anniversary of the Selma and Montgomery March. And I was there with one of the former Freedom Riders, Bernard Lafayette, who's the head of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference today. And he arranged a meeting with the two of us with many of the leaders, of Black Lives Matter leaders from Ferguson. And they wanted us to tell them what lessons they could learn from the Freedom Rides, from other other episodes of the Civil Rights Movement. And I'm not sure how much they got from us, but I, I was so impressed, not only with their commitment, but their 
sophistication, their understanding of where the na nation needed to go and maybe how they could, could make it go there. Um, so I came away feeling so much more optimistic. And that was five years ago. My faith in them has been fulfilled. And I see this in my own students. There's much more awareness and realization that you have to do more than just vote. You, you've got to be proactive. You, you've got to turn your beliefs into action. Martin Luther King believed that. John Lewis believed that. And I think uh, hopefully many more will come to that conclusion in the, in the future. A call to action seems like the right way to wrap it up. Raymond Arsenault, thank you. On the next episode of History As It Happens, it's back. Impeachment. I have never been a quitter. To leave office before my term is completed is abhorrent to every instinct in my body. Richard Nixon quit before Congress canned him. Donald Trump's trial in the Senate will take place with his presidency over. From Johnson to Nixon to Clinton to Trump, impeachment's always been complicated. We'll look at why no president's ever been convicted as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times.